And is this turn? Does it turn? Um, either or, either or, either that one. Or. I guess. Yeah, yeah. That would probably be easier. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا um <clears throat> inshallah ta'ala tonight is is um we'll discuss something i think that's very important this is kind of impromptu because i didn't make any preparation um brother abdul jalil uh volunteered me to come and speak so alhamdulillah uh in the spirit of cooperation and in cohesion uh, I agree. So um, we'll just speak a little bit about something that's very important to all of us. And that is the type of people that you keep in your circle. There was a, um, a, a clip on Instagram that was being spread around <clears throat> where uh, Will Smith had made reference to <clears throat> a quote by Rumi, who was you know, a very famous uh, philosopher in Islamic um, you find a lot of uh, Muslims who refer to his work. And the comment was about, um, in reference to a person living their lives like it's on fire, and to make sure that you keep people around you that fan your fire, meaning the people that you keep around you are the type of people that keep your fire burning. That as a human being, as an individual, you should be ambitious about life and the things that you believe is going to make your life you know, the best that it can be. And the type of people that you should keep around you are the type of people that should fan your fire, people that keep your ambition, keep you ambitious and encourage you to be ambitious. And, you know, you have a lot of um, vampires around you that steal, suck the energy out of you, that you keep. Sometimes we keep people in our circles that are constantly sucking our energy from us. So, when I saw the clip, I figured since that I was given an impromptu lecture that I would, you know, uh, kind of tap into that uh, based upon a narration that it reminded me of. And this is a narration that was uh, mentioned on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, this is a very famous statement amongst students of knowledge who <clears throat> use this quote to show how ambitious a person should be in their pursuit of seeking knowledge, but I'm going to expand and I'm going to broaden that scope beyond just the realm of seeking knowledge, but in every aspect of our lives. So alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. An Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, ma qala, lamma qubida, النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قلت لرجل من الأنصار هلما فلس فل فلنسأل أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن حديث رسول الله عليه الصلاة والسلام فإنهم اليوم كثير عبد الله بن أباس I want to kind of paint the picture for you عبد الله بن أباس he said that when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم died when his soul was taken was the exact wording that he used. He didn't say, Lama mata. He said, Lama qubida. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When his soul was taken, meaning when he moved on to the next phase of his life, as all of us will move on to the next phase of our lives, we start off in the scrotum of our fathers as a sperm, a sperm cell. And then we move from that 
to being nurtured in the wombs of our mothers for a period of nine months. And then that is the second phase of your life. And then you move from that phase into the world that we are in currently. So each and every one of us currently is in the third phase of our lives. And then around 60 to 70 years old, as the Prophet Wasallam said, أعمار أمتي بين ستين وسبعين وقليل من يجوز ذلك أو يجوز ذلك The Prophet Wasallam said the average age of my ummah is between 60 to 70 years and there's only a few that go beyond that. So around 60 to 70 year mark, the vast majority of us will expire. Our souls will be moved, removed from these vessels that we call bodies that our souls are in, inhabiting for the time period. And then we will be removed from this body and we will move on to the next phase of our lives, which is referred to in the Quran as the life in the barzakh, life in the grave. All right. That phase that every single one of us has to pass through as Allah says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin mawt, that every soul shall taste death. And Allah didn't say every soul will die because the soul is infinite. It doesn't die. All right. It is simply extracted from the body. And so that's why Allah uses the metaphor taste. You will taste death. All right. Meaning that you will have an experience. All right. Every soul will taste death. All right. And then we move on to our final phase of life. And that is either in the hellfire or eternal damnation in the, uh, in the hellfire or eternal bliss in paradise. So. He said that when the Prophet Sallallahu was taken, when his soul was taken, he said, I said to a companion of mine from the Ansar, one of my companions from the Ansar, and mind you, Abdullah bin Abbas, he was roughly uh, 18 years old when the Prophet Sallallahu died. We're talking about being ambitious as young men. All right. And this is something that we need to encourage our young men to aspire for greatness, not just in a religious context, but aspire for greatness in anything that you involve yourselves in. We have a generation of children that don't necessarily aspire to much. Entre this is the era of entrepreneurship. I don't understand why we are not teaching our young men how to be entrepreneurs. We have a president who, although come into the presidency with a different type of energy, he was a millionaire, right, off of his own endeavors before he even became the president. So coming into presidency, he brings a different type of energy. So you look at the world as it is now. Many young people are aspiring entrepreneurs in this day and age. While you have many Muslim children, our greatest accomplishment is to graduate from a university with a couple of letters behind our names only to go and to work for a company or work for another business and, you know, exercising all of the energy and all of the knowledge and all of the experience that we've gotten from those years in college and making somebody else rich. I, I mean, that to me, that would be hustling backwards. This is the era where we need to start to exercise our entrepreneurship uh, skills and putting our degrees to use and open up our own businesses. This is one of the greatest things that you can teach a young man how to fish for himself. All right. Uh, Dawood alayhi salam. He said that the best food that a man can eat from. Is from amal yadi. Is from the, the actions of it. Or the deeds of his own hands. Meaning you go out and you work for. Right. So he said when the Prophet sallallahu died. I said to a companion of mine from the Ansar. Halumma. Come on. Fanas'al. Ashab and Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so that we can go ask the companions of the Prophet about his narrations. This is foresight. He's thinking ahead. This is an eighteen-year-old boy who now realizes that there will come a time when the Sahaba will no longer be around, and if we do not take advantage of the knowledge that they have, right, then that knowledge is going to go to waste. He said, come, let's go ask the companions of the Prophet Wasallam about his hadith, his narrations. فَإِنَّهُمْ الْيَوْمْ كَثِيرٌ Because there are many of them today. This is thinking ahead. Thinking ahead uh, in terms of the Sahaba not being here at a certain time. Um, Muhammad, the pacifier is in my jacket, in jacket pocket. 
Him basically thinking ahead, forward thinking, as, as we would use in this day and time. All right, so it's important for us, you know, to be forward thinking people. All right, when you think about now, right now, and the institutions that we call masajid that are in our environments right now, many of the imams are older. You have a lot of younger students of knowledge that are graduating, coming back. Where are the people under their tutelage that are learning the religion so that this can be passed on to the next generation? Basically, what we're doing by sitting at lecture, 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 we're just eating for today. Where, where there's no institutions being established whereby the information students have been going back and forth overseas. The first American graduate from the Islamic University was Abdullah Hakim Quick, who's actually Canadian, but nonetheless Western student, right? And since that time, all the way up until now, students have been going back and forth overseas to Egypt, to Morocco, to Saudi Arabia, and to other places to learn, to Yemen, to learn Islam and come back. But there are no building of institutions whereby this information can be institutionalized and systematically passed on to the next generation of Islam. What we have is random halaqat, random lectures that are being done here and there. Um, but no system put in place so that this information could be passed on to another generation. And eventually, eventually what ends up happening is that the next generation loses a desire for seeking knowledge, which we've already seen that now. It's already happening. All right. Until three or four generations from now, there will be no seeking of knowledge. When we run into an issue, we call an imam, we call a scholar, how do I get out of this situation? We want them to basically solve the problem for us instead of the person learning how to fish so they can solve their own problems. So the problem is twofold. The problem is twofold. Number one, there's no system in place whereby teaching is systematic. I'm not talking about random halakat. I'm not talking about random lectures. I'm talking about systematic teaching, education, whereby people are being taught skills through the information that we have in Islam so that they can solve their own problems. It's like people are being strung along. When you have an issue, call the sheikh. When you have an issue, call the imam. Right To the point where even that is superimposed on students and knowledge. I've had people say, hey, um, could you call the sheikh and ask him what is the, 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 the solution to this problem? What's the delil for this? And it's just like, I can answer that for you. You want me to call the sheikh all the way overseas so you can have the direct link, right? And I speak your language. I'm part of your culture. I can explain that to you. But no, you want it directly from the sheikh. You know, this is, you know, for our own validation. So I can say, you know, I take from the sheikh. I don't take from students and knowledge. I can take it directly from the sheikh. Okay. There's obviously a language barrier here because if it wasn't, then you would be calling the sheikh yourself. So it's almost hustling backwards because I still have to translate to you what the sheikh is saying. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just mind-blowing. <laughs> mind-blowing, right? No, I want you to call the sheikh, okay? I still have to translate to you what the sheikh is saying. So, I mean, there could be a flaw, a mistake in my translation. I can tell you whatever I want to tell you and just say that the sheikh said it. That has been done for years, <laughs> Right or wrong, we have students of knowledge that'll tell you, Sheikh said this or Sheikh said that, and the Sheikh ain't say nothing. <laughs> he ain't say none of that. And that has been done for years. So, I mean, like, I'm talking about systematic education where, whereby brothers and sisters are being taught, given tools by which they can navigate their problems using Islam without necessarily the need of a imam or sheikh or this person or that person. That can be done. That's exactly what Ibn Abbas was talking about. He said, come on, let's go learn from the companions of the Prophet wasallam the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam because today they are plentiful. They are in abundance today, meaning there will come a time where they will no longer be here. So listen to what his, his friend said to him. فَقَالَ عَجَبًا العجب لَكَ يَا بن عباس. He said, you are amazing, O Ibn Abbas. He said, أَتَرَ النَّاسِ يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَيْكَ 
He said, do you ever think that people will be in need of someone like you? Do you ever think that there will come a time where people will need you? He's thinking in terms of now. Meaning, as long as the Sahaba are here, we will never need the likes of you. Right? Same thing that we do today. We say, well, you're a student of knowledge, but we take him from the sheikhs. Right? We take him from the ulama. Well, the ulama are dying every other year. Do you ever think that there will come a time where a student of knowledge who graduated from the university will ever actually become relevant? And more so now than ever. Because we are a part of this society. We are part of the fabric of this environment. We understand the culture. We understand the people. Not only that, we also have a connection with those who understand Islam on a greater scale or a higher scale than we do. So we are the plug, for lack of better words. And, I, and I'm, just, I'm just being honest. That Do we ever think that there will come a time where students of knowledge will be more relevant than what they are today? Because today it's just like the student of knowledge is just the, the, the gateway to the scholars. We don't really need the students of knowledge. All we need you to do is translate for us what the sheikhs say, what the ulama say. All right, but there will come a time when that same student of knowledge will become more relevant. More relevant and even more so today than, for, than ever. So, I mean, you know, we have to start being, you know, forward thinking, thinking about where is this going? Where are we going? Where as an Islamic community here in America, where are we 20 years from now? What's our relationship with those scholars that we hold in high esteem today are gone, long gone. And the Prophet Sallallahu prophesies that the loss of knowledge will be through what? The loss of knowledge will occur through what? The death of the scholars. You, you, see, you see how that works? He said that knowledge will go away. The habil ilm, knowledge will disappear. He said, and I don't mean that knowledge will disappear in tiza'in, min kulubin nas, that Allah will remove knowledge by taking it out of the hearts of people. He said, lakin the habil ilm bi qabdil ulama. But knowledge will disappear through the dying off of the scholars because knowledge was not taken from them and systematically integrated into societies whereby they could function even in the absence of scholars. You follow me? So now the knowledge, the scholar dies and he takes all of his ilm with him. It's so, it's, it's, it's by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Shaykh Uthameen rahmatullahi alayhi, he only wrote about three or four books in his entire life. But all of the books that we have of Shaykh Uthameen today was through the work of his daughter and her husband who transcribed all of those lectures that were recorded on audio and turned them into books. You understand? That is the way that we have that information today, preserved. Walillahi alhamd. You know, so it's important that we become forward thinking, forward thinking in terms of how do we preserve Islam for the next generation? Because as it stands right now, many of us are not, you know, we haven't learned Islam systematically whereby we can navigate our own problems. We're constantly making phone calls to this person, that person. So it's twofold. We don't really see the need to learn Islam in a systematic way whereby we can navigate our problems. And secondly, the teaching that is being given from a lot of the students and knowledge is not being given in a systematic way where people, where they can make themselves less and less, you know, um, relevant. Part of being a good leader is to make yourself irrelevant. You educate everyone else so that you can move, take a step back, and people can function by themselves. Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, uh, uh, he, said um, he said that I wish that people knew this knowledge. He said, so I wish that people, everyone would learn this knowledge so no one would attribute anything to me. I would not be singled out with anything. Everybody is on an equal plane because everyone is knowledgeable. All right? So he said, come, let's go learn. Let's go ask the companions of the Prophet Wasallam so that we can learn the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam." And the man turned around and he said to Ibn Abbas, do you think that there will ever come a time where people will need you? 
And he was saying that because he was looking at it from where they stood at that moment. He said, هَلْ تَرَى النَّاسِ عَجَبًا لَكَ يَا إِبْنَ بَاسِ أَتَرَى النَّاسِ يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَيْكَ وَفِي الْأَرْضِ مَنْ تَرَى مِنْ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, how amazing are you, O Ibn Abbas? Do you ever think that people will be in need of you while they are the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that are still around today? Ibn Abbas was thinking further than that. What about the time that comes when they are no longer around? All right? And this is what created movements like the Khawarij, who, although did not learn their Islam from the companions of the Prophet Wasallam. they yet used Islam to make the takfir on many of the Sahaba. And actually killed many of the Sahaba. You understand? This is what happens in the absence of ilm, the absence of knowledge. Right? You had a person, Abdurrahman ibn Muljam, who memorized the entire Qur'an, who Umar radiallahu anhu sent him to Egypt to teach the people in Egypt the Qur'an. He wrote a letter to Amr ibn al-As, he said, I'm sending to you Abdurrahman ibn Muljim. I've given you precedence over my own self. I mean, I want him here in Medina, but I'm sending him to you in Egypt. He said, فَإِذَا جَاءَكَ فَجْعَلْ لَهُ دَارًا يُقْرِئُ أَهْلَ الْمَصْرِ الْقُرْآنِ He said, when he comes to you in Egypt, make for him a home, build for him a house, so that he could teach people in Egypt the Qur'an. This same individual, Abdurrahman ibn Muljam, was the same one who decapitated Ali ibn Abi Talib, cut his entire head off. This was a memorizer of the Qur'an. This is in the absence of knowledge, right? The absence of real understanding of the religion. We go from Abu Bakr anhu who stood up in front of the Sahaba when the Prophet died, and he said, "Man kana yabudu Allah fa inna Allah hayyum. Man kana yabudu Muhammadin fa inna Muhammadin kad mata. Wa man kana yabudu Allah subhanahu wa taala fa inna hu hayyun la yamut." He said that whoever used to worship Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. But whoever used to worship Allah, then Allah, God, is ever living and He never dies. And then out of the 6,236 6, ayats in the Qur'an, Abu Bakr reaches into the Qur'an and pulls out this one ayat. Out of 6,236 verses in the Qur'an, Abu Bakr sifts through those 6,000 and some odd verses and pulls out one ayat. Right there on the spot. That is, brothers and sisters, fiqh fiddin. That is understanding your religion. To be able spot on at that very moment, fil hal, at that very moment, to reach into the Quran and pull out an ayah that is so relevant to that situation. That is understanding your religion. And he quoted the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, um, مَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَا إِمَّا تَأَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبَ عَلَىٰ أَعْقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيَجِزِ اللَّهُ شَاكِرِينَ That Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger. Many messengers have come before him. If he dies or is, or is killed, will you turn back on your heels? And indeed, if you turn back on your heels, you will not harm Allah in the least. And Allah will reward those who are grateful. And Umar anhu was so amazed at Abu Bakr's fiqh fi deen. He said, كَأَنَّهُ أَوَّلُ مَرَّ سَمِعْتَ هَذِهِ الْآيِ He said it was as if this was the first time I had ever heard that verse in my life. Meaning he heard the verse before, but there was never a situation where at, wherein the verse became came to life at that moment. Where the verse now had relevance. Immediate relevance, because all of the eyes in the Qur'an have relevance. However, we're talking about immediate relevance right there on the spot. That is fiqh fi deen. That is someone, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, who didn't memorize the whole Qur'an, but what he did know of the Qur'an, it was understanding. The same one who, he said, Wallahi, I will fight anyone who refuses to pay zakat. Because Allah does not make a distinction in the Qur'an between salat and zakat. Every time Allah mentions salat in the Qur'an, He mentions the cat right along with it. So He used His understanding of following this, you know, this, this pattern, this thread, that every time Allah mentions salat, He mentions the cat right along with it. He said, so anyone who separates the two, I will fight every single one of them. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala was saying, how can you fight people who say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Abu Bakr said, wallahi, I will fight every single one of them. And he would not budge. 
That is fiqh fid deen, understanding of the religion. Fast forward to Abdurrahman ibn Muljam, Hafiz Qur'an, memorized the entire Qur'an, and then uses the Qur'an to justify his murder of the cousin of the Prophet wasallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. This is the difference between this and this. There's a difference between memorizing, simply memorizing the Qur'an, memorizing a hadith with no understanding, and not necessarily memorizing the entire Qur'an, but what you do memorize, you do understand. There's depth to your understanding. And there's a difference between the two. So we have to make sure that our teaching of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, it leads to the result of what happened with Abu Bakr, and not that our memorizing Islam leads to what happened with Abdurrahman ibn Muljam. You follow me? We got to look at the end goal here. Is our learning of Islam leading more towards what, how Abu Bakr, you know, how he handled himself with the religion? Or is our learning of Islam or our memorizing of Islam leading us more so down a path of what happened to Abdurrahman ibn Muljam? And I mean, you guys can answer that. Are we becoming more united and more understanding of the religion? Are we becoming more divided and separated and fragmented? Although we don't understand the religion. I mean, you know, just, you know, just something to think about. I'm not passing judgment on anyone. I'm just saying it's something to think about. And our teaching has to be more structured, has to be more systematic, and not just these random you know, tidbits of information that we're getting from here and here, and we don't know how to connect the dots with it. The world is just a puzzle you know, in front of your face until you begin to connect all of the pieces and you can see the picture clearly. And what we have in Islam and many of our masajid is just tidbits of information and people still don't know how to make the connection. So, what did Ibn Abbas say to this individual? He said, فَتَرَقْتُهُ He said, I told him, come on, let's go learn from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ while they are still alive. There are many of them. And the man says to Ibn Abbas, do you think that people will actually be in need of you while the companions of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ are in abundance? Ibn Abbas said, فَتَرَقْتُهُ So I abandoned him. That's the point of my lecture here. That when people are not Fanning your fire, fanning your flames, right? You set your life on fire, meaning you become ambitious when you have people around you that steal your ambition from you, then you need to cut them off. Be careful about the people that you keep around you. Ibn Abbas said, فَتَرَقْتُهُ I abandoned him. Because by keeping somebody like that around me, what's eventually going to happen? You're going to steal my zeal. You're going to take my zeal from me. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ would not have been an Allahu Adam whether or not his narrative would have ended the way that it did had it not been for Khadija. He came home, he was vulnerable. He didn't understand what was happening. And Khadija helped him to make sense of everything that was happening to him. Just imagine a woman's married to a man and he comes home one day and says, I saw an, this creature. And describes to his wife what that would have been. A, that was a test for Khadija at that moment. And because of what she knew about him, she knew that there was no way. There had to be a logical explanation for what he saw. Because I know this man. How many of our wives are tested the same way? We come home and we say, I want to invest in this or I want to engage in that. And they steal it right away from us. Right? Like the story of Ismail. Collected in Sahih al-Bukhari on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said that when uh, Ibrahim salam went to go visit Ismail, right, his son, and he knocked on the door, his wife came to the door, and he said, you know, where is Ismail? She said he went out, you know, to seek, you know, our livelihood, to seek our sustenance. And then he began to ask about their living condition. How are you living? How's your, your situation? And she said, it's horrible. We don't have this. We don't have that. We don't have this. We don't have... Could you imagine living with somebody like that? That everything that you do is never good enough? Everything that you bring to the table is never good enough? Could you imagine living with someone like that? And what did Ibrahim say? He said, when your husband comes home, then give him from me the greeting of salam. And to tell him, I said, change your threshold. Meaning the mat in front of your door, to change that. Meaning, divorce her. 
Here again, when someone does not ignite your fire or fan your fire of ambition, you have to abandon them. This was even as it relates to his spouse. I'm not saying for you to go home and divorce your wives or for women to go home and say, you don't fan my fire, so I want to divorce. That's not what I'm saying here. But what I am saying is to make sure that your ambitions are not smothered. Your ambitions are not smothered or suppressed by the person that should be in your corner. The person that should be encouraging you, right? Especially for young men. Young men are very, or should be very ambitious. And it only takes one person to steal that from you. Sometimes it could be your mom. Sometimes it could be your own family members, your own brother, your sister. They can steal that from you. And then you go through life having all of these. You ever run into someone who have all of these big dreams, but they never achieve anything? Why is that? <laughs> because they always run into a place where they tell themselves, okay, this is where I should stop. I shouldn't go any further. And that's a condition. Sometimes moms do that to their children. You steal that from them, right? Our, our religion teaches us to be excellent in everything that we do. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Inna Allah katab al-ihsan ala kulli shay, that Allah has prescribed perfection in everything that we do. You should never steal that from someone. Yeah, we direct people to go a certain path, but we should never take that away from them because if in fact the fear is you're going to fail, guess what? We learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. You have a hell of a story to tell even after you hit rock bottom. Right? A person said to me some years ago, he's like, you're the type of person that always jumps out the window without a, you know, without a, without a parachute. I said, yeah, well, I have a hell of a story to tell when I hit the bottom. But you, I'm going to look up at you still at the window because you're never going to jump. Because it has to be completely perfect for you in order for you to jump. And it's never the perfect time, never the perfect situation for you to jump. You put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for either azamta for tawakkul ala Allah. That when you have made your decision, then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is what it is. We cannot be driven by our fear of failure. Because even if you fail, guess what? You have a, a plethora of experiences along the way that you can take with you in, towards your next endeavor. But, you know, you think about Ibrahim alayhi salam, he told his wife, that when my son, when uh, Ismail comes home, give him the greeting of salam and tell him to change his threshold. When Ismail came home, he asked the woman, did someone come by here today? His wife, did someone come by here today? She said, yes, some old man with a gray beard. He said, well, what did he ask? She said, he asked about our living situation. And then Ismail said, well, then what, what else did he say? She said, he told me to convey to you the greeting of salam and to tell you to change your threshold. He said, that was my father. And that means that he told me to divorce you. Go home to your family. Ilhaqi bi ahlik. Go home to your family. Meaning you're no good for me. This is a man who is aspiring to be a prophet. <laughs> His ambition, the greatest ambition that any man could have, is that Ibrahim alayhi salam preparing him from day one to be the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he knew that you're not going to get that far when you have someone like that in your corner. Constantly complaining. Everything that you bring to the table is never good enough. You're never going to get that far with someone like that in your corner. You got to let her go. Think about that. So going back to the statement of Ibn Abbas, he said, فَتَرَقْتُهُ So I abandoned him. <laughs> there was no need for me to keep a friend like that around me. That every time I you know, suggest something, he's always telling me a million reasons why I shouldn't do it. And basically, people want to project on you the fears that they have of themselves. You are in fear. You, feel, you fear failure. I don't. I'm okay with failure. I've been a failure all my life. It's part of who I am. I'm not afraid of failure, but you are. But then you project your fears on me. So you tell me, oh no, you shouldn't do that. Oh no, you can't do that. You can't do this. When people start, people around you and they start to talk like that, you have to be weary of people around you like that. Telling you what you can't do, telling you what you shouldn't do. I'm a believer in letting a man be a man. If that's what you want to do, go right ahead. Let me give you some, you know, some, let me paint you a picture. 
And then at the end of the day, it's still your choice. But in Islam, what I noticed from the moment I converted to Islam, that as Muslims, we project our fears onto one another. A brother comes and says, hey, I'm thinking about taking a second one. Oh, Aki, don't do that. You're going to destroy your first marriage. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And then you leave the brother feeling conflicted because now this is something that he wants to do, but you've actually now compromised because you are afraid to do it. Your wife won't let you have another wife. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to use that example, but I'm talking to men here, so this is usually the top ambitions that we have, some of us, Right? Because your wife won't let you have another wife, right? So now you begin to project that fear onto me. And that's not fair. And so Ibn Abbas, he did exactly what a person should do when you have people like that around you. He said, I abandoned him. Get away from me. I don't need to ask your opinion on anything else anymore because you've actually shown me who you are. And then he said, Ibn Abbas, he continued, he said, um, and Ibn Abbas says, so I continued with my journey, my ambition of learning the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. He said, so I would go and I would ask questions. I would ask this person, ask that person. He didn't let that person's uh, statement stop him and there are many of us right now who are sitting on a desire and ambition and we cannot move we are stuck in time because someone projected their fear on us and so you had this thought in your mind for years I want to open up a business I want to do this I want to go here I want to go to Egypt I want to go to Saudi Arabia want... it's just ambition hanging in the balance because someone came along and told you, you couldn't do it. Or you were foolish for thinking that you could do that. And what they did was they projected their fear on you. And had you stuck in this sunken place. And all your ambitions are, are just ambitions that are just theory in your head. And you allowed someone to take that away from you. Ibn Abbas, he said, no, he said, فَأَقْبَلْتُ So I began my journey in asking the Prophet ﷺ's companions. He said, my pursuit of seeking knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ's hadith had driven me to a point where if I heard that someone had a hadith that I did not hear, then I would take off my shirt, my cloak, and I would lay it down in front of his door. And I would lay down at his door and wait for him to come out. He said, and the wind would blow, blowing sand in my face, and I would lay there until the person came out. And then finally, when he would come out, he would say, what brought you to my door, O cousin of the Prophet ﷺ? And I would say to him that it reached me that you have a hadith that is reported on the Prophet ﷺ, and I want you to teach it to me. Ambitious. Ambitious. Him laying his cloak down in front of the door of someone and the wind blowing sand in his face, all of that, it happened. But for us, it's metaphorical of the challenges and the trials and tribulations that come along with you being or in pursuit of your ambitions. You follow me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to just give you anything. Sometimes Allah tests you to see how much you really want it because what you work for, once you get it, you value it. Anyone that has gotten anything without working for it doesn't value it. As the scholars, they have a saying, لا ينال العلم براحة الجسد You will never achieve or attain knowledge by relaxation. You got to exert from yourself. They say knowledge in تُعْتِيَهُ كُلَّكْ رُبَّمَا يُعْتِيكَ بَعْضَهُ That knowledge is such as that if you give knowledge all of yourself, Perhaps it will give you some of itself. That's how knowledge is. 
And you can tell the difference between students of knowledge who come back from their respective places of study who actually benefited from their knowledge versus those who were there involved in Kila were called. He said, she said, this shake warned to get this person, stay away from that person. You can tell the difference between a real student of knowledge who benefited from his time versus someone who was there, you know, you know, for lack of better words, you know, just, you know, just wasting time. You can tell the difference between the two. The sincerity the degree, the depth of their understanding, right? Those who engage in he said, she said, and warning against this one and staying away from that one, they are as shallow, shallow, shallow. And the deeper you go with them, the more shallow you realize they are. They can only go but to a certain point. And even lay people, for lack of better terms, even people who are not necessarily learned, who can navigate with just basic common sense and whatever degrees or whatever, you know, secular knowledge they have can see it spotted a mile away. This person doesn't really have a lot of. Bits of information that they were able to retain for the time that they did pay attention, but they don't they're not sitting on any real knowledge, any real in. So. Ibn Abbas, he continued, he said, that I would say to the person that it reached you, that a narration, that it reached me, that you hold a narration, that you have a narration from the Prophet wasallam, and I want you to teach it to me. فَأَحْبَبْتُ and أَسْمَعْهُ مِنْكَ And I wanted to hear it directly from you. فَيَقُولُ فَهَلْ بَعَثْتَ إِلَيَّ حَتَّى أَتِيكَ so the companion would say, well, why didn't you send someone to me so I could come to you? You are the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why didn't you send someone to me and I would have come to you? And Ibn Abbas, he said, فَأَنَا كُنْتُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ أَتِيكَ I had more right that I come to you. You had more right that I come to you than for you to come to me as knowledge. يُؤْتَى إِلَيْ وَلَا يَأْتِي إِلَيْكَ Knowledge, you go to it. Knowledge does not come to you. Knowledge does not just, you know, mysteriously land in your lap. You go after it. There's a pursuit that you have of knowledge, and perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you. He said, فَكَانَ ذَلِكَ الرَّجُلْ يَمُرُّ بِي بَعْدُ وَالنَّاسِ يَسْأَلُونِ فَيَقُولُ أَنْتَ كُنْتَ أَعْقِلُ مِنِّي He said, the same individual that I abandoned years ago, he said, later on, I was in a mosque in Damascus, in another narration. I was all the way up in Damascus, right? In the area of Syria, Palestine, that whole area up there. All right, many of the Sahaba migrated to that area later on, right? He said, later on, I was in a mosque teaching people. And this same individual that I abandoned years ago, he walked up and saw a crowd of people around me. And when he peeked over the crowd and he saw that it was me that everyone was asking, he said, Kunta anta a'akilu minni. He said, you were smarter than I was. I should have followed you. Right? Because people usually don't see your greatness, right, until you've actually arrived. Right? And champions are not born in the ring. Champions are simply recognized there. You were great the moment you decided to embark on that ambition. The person just didn't see it in you. They only saw it after you've achieved what they perceive to be success. Because I've arrived at this place doesn't make me successful. What makes me successful is that I had the goal. I had the heart and the audacity to pursue what I wanted in life. That is what made me successful. You understand? What makes you successful is not that you achieved your goal. Because that's usually how people identify, oh, wow, mashallah, he finally opened up his business. He's successful. No, he was successful the whole journey. You just didn't see it because your perception of what success is, is the end goal, not the journey to it. You understand? What makes you successful is the fact that you put your foot on the road to your pursuit. That is what made you successful. Because some people never lift a foot. Some people never lift a foot in the direction of the things that they are pursuing in life. They only talk about it. Yeah, one day I want to do this. Inshallah, one day I'm going to do that. You just simply talk about it. That's a failure because you sit from a place of privilege and talk about what you want to do. 
And then sometimes you have the audacity to criticize people who are actually doing it or in pursuit of it. So understand what real success is. Real success is not once you've achieved your goal. Real success is the goal that you created in your mind and the audacity that you had to pursue it. That is what makes a person successful. So he realized at the end that Abdullah bin Abbas was actually right and I actually should have followed him. I should have listened to him and I should have followed him. And we have a lot of those people in our environments today that say, oh, you know, I wish. And even after you become or achieve some level of success, they still never give it to you. They still never say, you know what? I, you, you were right. You were spot on the whole time. You know, they never give it to you. And, and that's their insecurity, not yours, because I wasn't doing it to receive any props. I wasn't doing it. I was just living my life, right? I wasn't doing what I was doing, seeking any props from anybody. I was just simply living my life. So it doesn't make me any difference whether you give it to me or you don't. That doesn't, you know, I don't live in your praise, so I don't die in your criticism. It doesn't really matter. And this is what I wanted to present in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his best. Um, as you can see, um, I, didn't, I didn't prepare anything huge. I think that that was sufficient, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, if there was anyone who had any questions or comments regarding uh, what was presented, inshallah, we'll take a few minutes before the then uh, and address that. Wasallallahu ala nabida Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama taslima kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Naam habibi. Well, yeah, come. So, um, I had this conversation with someone last this past week. Um, there's a lecture series going on in Baltimore right now, and it was entitled uh, Establishing Our Community as a Fundamental Seller. And then they had some scholar from Egypt who was supposed to tell them again, and some of these people are not from this country. So, uh, my question to the person is. Why are we asking somebody who lives thousands of miles away on advice on how to fix our situation here, our country, when we have the guidance set revealed to us by Allah and implemented by His Messenger? We have that. We just have to do it. Why do we have to run to somebody who doesn't know anything about our culture, our language, our situation in the country? Why are we asking them not to say that we shouldn't go to them, but we need to establish our own, we need to do it ourselves? Why are we doing that? And it's like, it was like, what? what are you talking about? I'm like, never mind. So I had to explain it, never mind. So yeah. my question is, what is it with the the, the, um, the, 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 the African American that when you tell them that we can do this ourselves, we have the religion, we just need to do it. We don't need to keep running to this person and that person. They don't live here. They, they don't, they, they probably, some of them probably never been to this country, so they don't know what goes on here. Why do we have to keep, why do we? What is it? Is it is it our tradition that we've been through this country that the islands have become what white people were to us? Or what is it that we can't see that we can do this ourselves? You know what I'm saying? We have the who that you know what I'm saying? We can make it do it. I overstand you. I overstand you. <laughs> Trust me, been there, done that. Um, he said, why is it, and I'll rephrase the question in a manner that's more easily digestible. Uh, he said, why is it that um, some of us as Muslims, more and more particular African-American Muslims, why do sometimes we feel that um, the solution to our problem lies in um, information or lies in, you know, the wisdom of scholars from other countries without looking at what we have here in front of us um, to solve the, the problem or to help us navigate the problem. I mean, the asking a scholar overseas about their advice on how we should approach this situation or that situation, there's not actually nothing wrong with that. What happens is uh, in, in between asking that question to that particular scholar and the information that he gives and the lack of using our own common sense and our own resources along with that, that becomes the problem. Simply reaching out to any scholar and saying, hey, what is your take on this or that or what you think our approach should be this and that and kind of laying it all out for them and help let them help us navigate through a situation based upon the knowledge and experience that they have. There's actually nothing wrong with that. Where it becomes problematic is when we say, OK, we're going to take everything that this scholar say and we're going to now go full force, full throttle with implementing what he said. 
and we're actually going against what our the dictates of our co own common sense and our own understanding of our cultural situation or dynamic here. That's when it becomes problematic. When a scholar says um, women in America should not, Muslim women in America should not work, but they should get on welfare so they don't have to work. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? No, they've said that without a doubt. I'm, I, I kid you not. It's real talk. I'm giving you facts. I mean, like it's I mean, the, the look on your faces right now says it all. Why in the world would I say, OK, well, that's what the sheikh said. And now, like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, taking a scholar's advice does not exempt you from using common sense. That's what I'm saying. If it take me, rahimahullah ta'ala, in describing the sahaba, he said that they used to navigate their problems using a combination of uh, al-aql wa naql intellect and revelation. There was a combination of the two. Al-aql wa naql. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a whole book against those who give precedence to the intellect over revelation. We use them simultaneously. This is what Allah commands us using, looking at our cultural dynamic, our cultural setup here. How is the best, what is the best approach to implementing that? So asking a scholar overseas for their advice about this or about that, there's actually nothing wrong with that. All right. But what becomes problematic is then when we take that and we begin to implement it and enforce it in an environment where it does not fit, right? It's like trying to take a piece of a puzzle and trying to jam it into a space where it doesn't belong. And although the puzzle piece goes in there and it looks very awkward because it doesn't fit, meaning the advice that that particular scholar gave was not appropriate or applicable to our environment. And with all due respect to him, it was his advice. It was based upon what we presented to him. Because that's another thing. A lot of these brothers, when they call out and reach out to scholars, they don't explain to the scholar our entire dynamic. It's from one paradigm, and that's their paradigm. It's from one perspective, and it's their perspective. Well, you know, we have in our environment, you know, people doing this and this and this from a very narrow they don't broaden, you know, the question so that the sheikh can see the whole situation for what it is. They only see it from their paradigm. That's it. And so therefore the sheikh gives a response based upon the paradigm that you paint it to him. And then now those same individuals take that response and they superimpose it on everybody instead of only on themselves whom you gave him your paradigm. So it should be applicable to you and to you only. You can't take a scholar statement and apply it to me when I wasn't a part of, you know, you explaining to the sheikh what, how, what our dynamic was. You, you can't do that. You had a personal conversation with a sheikh about my situation. And I had no, listen, man, I am not a passenger in my own journey to self-discovery. I'm sorry. I'm not riding shotgun, right? You don't get to go to a scholar and paint to him a picture of my life. And then get a shake to, you know, rule on my life and then come and superimpose it on me. I'm not a robot. I don't function like that. And you're not going to get the response that you think you're going to get. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that's to pretty much answer that question. And people who do that, they are few and far in between at this point. Man. They're really irrelevant, honestly. In, in the grand scheme of, you know, Islam here in America, people who do that. Uh, they're, they're very few and far in between. Not only that, they're really irrelevant in the grand scheme of it all. You know, I, I would say in 10 to 15 years, that whole dynamic, that whole, you know, philosophy will be completely forgotten about. Because those individuals, much like the, the larger, I mean, at least with the larger masses of the Muslim community here in America, there, there, there is some type of inheritance that you know, brothers are leaving behind Masajid. There are, you know, some, you know, uh, imams that are, you know, passing on their ilm, you know, on a small level, but it's, it's being passed on. As for those communities that do things like that, they have no one else to carry on. Theirs is a revolving door of people on their generation. As far as the next generation of those individuals, their children, their children continuously run away from that because it's, it's, it's not truth in its essence. It's a bit in portions of the truth. But it's not truth in its essence. Because if that was the case, people would be flocking towards it. 
people have a natural inclination towards truth. That's how Allah wired us. Allah wired us as human beings to have a natural inclination towards what is truth. But when you profess to have truth and you find people running away from you, then at some point you have to question whether or not what you are presenting is really truth or is it just bits and pieces of truth? Is it bits and pieces? Yeah. I mean, that's just being realistic. And that's not to say that the Salafi da'wah is not the truth. It is the truth. But the, the presentation of it to the masses here in America are only bits and pieces of the truth that has been sewn together to make this makeshift truth that is only truth in the eyes of the people who they approach Islam in that manner. But it's just in reality, if you were to pick it apart, you were to unloosen the threads of it, it would completely fall apart because all they have is bits and pieces of truth that they've put together and they've created their own, you know, paradigm. Yeah. And that's, of course, just my take on it. Yeah. So building on that, Sheikh, in regards to what you said as far as the youth running away from that, because they don't really want to deal with that, what advice do you have for us that are trying to get our youth to hold on to their Islam? But because, you know, a lot of the massages that we, we normally attend, that's, that's what you hear right. all the time. You know what I'm saying? Right. So how do we keep our children, you know, um, within, you know, the, the realm of Islam and not actually come, you know, completely leaving Islam because of this particular dynamic? We have to begin to fill in the blanks with the approach of the Salafi Dawah, the, the Salafi Dawah, the approach that many masajid, especially in these areas, the approach that many masajids have had in the past they were like incomplete sentences. You have bits and pieces of truth here and there, but there's a lot of blanks that need to be filled in. And for our children, what they do is they see the sentence, you know, see it incomplete, and they just completely turn away from it. But we as parents who understand and know how to put things in perspective, we have to fill in the blanks for them. So when you say, okay, there's no intermingling, we should stay away from intermingling, okay, then we have to put that in perspective, that we live in an environment that is a, you know, basically... You know, uh, an intermingling environment. That's the dynamic of the environment that we live in. But then Allah tells us in the Quran, Fattakullah Mastata'atum, fear Allah as much as you have the ability. That is where principles like that come into play. So yes, while we would, you know, that doesn't mean don't engage in our environment because it's intermingling. Because then that wouldn't put you back in this little box in this little bubble, which our children are uncomfortable being in that space. It's like, all right, I have friends that are not Muslim, friends that are not practicing Muslims. So where does that leave me as a Muslim kid who my parents want me to be practicing Muslims? Where does that leave me? Do I just completely isolate myself from everyone? Because that is what has happened in the past. Here again, the, the unfinished sentence. We give you one version of Islam without explaining it to you. So we'll say intermingling is haram. That's an incomplete sentence. Because there's no, the blanks are not filled in in that sentence. So we'll say, stay away from, so it's just like all or nothing. You stay away from the intermingling, basically meaning stay away from society altogether. Anywhere where you see women, stay away. But then that creates another problem because, you know, if you say stay away from women or stay away from environments where they're intermingling, then um, where are they going to go get a job? So then we have young people who sit in the masjid all day long. Their lives are empty. Completely empty because they were given a half a half a sentence. Stay away from intermingling without filling in any of the blanks. We fill in the blank by explaining to them. Yes, while there is intermingling in our environment, we fear a law to the best of our ability. We avoid situations that we can avoid. And in situations that are unavoidable, we fear a law to the best of our ability in those situations. We fill in the blanks. You, you, fo you follow me? We fill in the blanks. We are adults. We have, we have experiences in life. Our world view is a little more broad. We've been places. We've seen things. We've been in environments. All right. We've traveled. And all of those things have enhanced our world view so much so that now when we look at Islam, we don't see it through this little tunnel. We see it in light of the whole world that is around us. And we are able to help them put things in perspective. So when a child comes and says, oh, I just heard a lecture and the person said that, you know, I should stay away from kuffar. Stay away from people who are disbelievers or not befriend people who are disbelievers under the guise of wala wal bara. 
all right, allegiance and association with Islam and Muslims and disassociation and, you know, and separation from those who are disbelievers. Okay, that's an incomplete sentence because there are, there's a clarification to that. Allah tells us clearly in the Quran that Allah does not forbid you, right, from intermingling or from, from being just and fair and being, you know, equitable to those who disbelieve. So as long as they don't fight you for your religion, they don't remove you from your homes and they don't fight you for your religion. So that means that the kuffar, non-Muslims, are in different categories and not approached the same way all the time. We fill in the blanks because the approach to the Salafi da'wah has been just that, black and white. Because many of those who are proponents of the Salafi da'wah in our environments, many of them, their worldview is as close as my hand is to my face right now. They've never been anywhere. Their, their experiences are very limited. And so therefore their understanding of Islam and the information that they have is very shallow. Real talk. Real talk. Year after year after year go by, you do not see them enhancing in their understanding. You do not see them in evolving. You see the same solid black and white message year after year after year, decade after decade. They don't evolve. Scholars would write fatawa. Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah wrote fatawa about Hajj. When he went to go perform Hajj, he realized that a lot of the fatawa were not hard and fast rules. And when he came back, he erased, he changed a lot of fatawa regarding Hajj because he now experienced it himself. Imam Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he has, uh, when you study fiqh, you'll find Imam Shafi'i fil qadim wa Imam Shafi'i fil hadith. What that means is that Imam Shafi'i, he wrote a lot of uh, rulings thick, on thick issues when he was in Iraq. When he migrated to Egypt, which is where he died, he changed a lot of his rulings because he now was having a different experience. Knowledge evolves, human beings evolve. So when you see people who are holding on to this hard and fast black and white version of Islam and they're not evolving with their knowledge and their experiences, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that because we are supposed to evolve. As human beings, our life experiences. Are you mean to tell me the same fetwas that were given in the 70s are the same fetwas that are given in 2018? Come on, where's the evolution of our knowledge, of our experiences that are dictating uh, a evolution of our knowledge? It's not happening. With a lot of them, it doesn't happen. Which means that they don't have any depth to their understanding of Islam. They learn what is very much on the surface and they stick to that and that's it. Even if it goes against pure God-given common sense. So for us as, as Muslim parents who are trying to keep our children balanced and keep them in the loop of making sure that they are still practicing Muslims without leaving Islam, we have to fill in the blanks for them. They've been given a very hard and fast black and white code or system of Islam that is not cohesive and not congruent with the times that we live in. You say intermingling is haram, okay, so what, what is my out? And they never give you options. And even the options that you give you are not even commonsensical. So I'm supposed to, everybody's supposed to sell oils. But even in selling oils, a lot of them, they contradict themselves because they'll stand on the street corner and touch the hand of women and give them, you know, fragrances so they can smell it, so they can buy it. So you'll tell other people intermingling is haram. It's, just, it's like what Bani Israel did. Allah tell them in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran that, uh, that they used to enjoin what is good on other people, but then not follow it themselves. Right? And this is what, what it is. It's like you're enjoying what is good on everybody else, but you don't follow it yourself. Uh, no, we have to fill in the blanks for our children. Don't let those run-on sentences or those incomplete sentences dictate the course of their lives. We have to step in as parents who have experience, who have understanding, and put everything in perspective for them. Yes, that is haram. Yes, you should stay away from that. However, this is the understanding of that in light of other ayats and other hadith and as well as the world that we live in. Absolutely. We have to make Islam real for them. Islam was very theoretical. Years ago, it's like, this is what the Quran and Sunnah dictates. This is haram. That is haram. It's, it's very theoretical. But then when you get in the Maidan, when you get in the environment where that is supposed to be practiced, you, you, don't, you don't get any of that. No. Like 
both. We're talking about school, Islamic schools, especially for African Americans. I am I, I am waiting for the day when African American Muslims who are constantly teaching in these other, you know, Islamic schools and this that's that's no no pun intended to uh, a lot of the, the schools that are not African American, you know, ran and and predominantly the most of the teachers are African American. Because what we'll do is we'll work for those type of schools. But we won't pull our resources together and create schools for our own children. That's a problem. Because our children, African American children, especially those of us who have converted to Islam, we have a different, we, have, we, we require, we have different needs. And a lot of, out of a lot of Indo-Pak, out of teachers, they don't understand the needs that our children have. So our children are usually written off as behavior problems. They need some other outside help. Simply because they don't function in what your mind is from your paradigm, how children are supposed to function in the classroom. And, and I work at an Islamic school, so I see it firsthand. I see how the, um, the Arabic teacher, just saying in general, the Arabic teacher who can speak very little English, right? He's put in the school, he teaches Arabic. Most of the time, no degree. But because he's a good brother, mashallah, and he speaks Arabic and he can teach Arabic, we're going to put, stick him in there to teach the children Arabic. All right. He has no understanding of how children function. She has no understanding of children and how they function and the different levels that children are at in their understanding and their development. Right. They have no understanding of that. So they come into the class and they put Alif, Bad, Ta, Ja, Mim, Ha, on the on the board and they turn around and Muhammad, the African-American kid, is laughing and giggling with another kid. The teacher gets upset. Muhammad sit down. Oh, matter of fact, get out. This is this is how Muhammad is dealt with because he's an African American. However, Ahmed and another kid who is Egyptian or is Indo Pak Arab, right? They're dealt with differently. Wallah aladhim, I kid you not. Wallah aladhim, I kid you not. They're dealt with differently. Theirs is a level of tolerance because they understand because they come from the same culture. But with us, with African Americans, no, because they don't understand our culture and because they have been fed a narrative about our culture that depicts us as people who have problems with learning and sitting still and behaving and understanding. Don't think that the narratives that they have been fed in their own countries about African Americans don't follow them in their journey to becoming teachers. Absolutely follows them. Follows them without a doubt. So a lot of children, uh, African-American children, or including African children as well, all right, what they do is they catch a bad, they have bad, horrible experiences in a lot of these Islamic schools. Uh, horrible experiences. And unfortunately, the Islamic teachers that are going to that school that are African-Americans care more about their job than they do the children that are being oppressed in those environments. So they say nothing. They turn a blind eye. They don't walk past a classroom. You hear the teacher yelling at the kid and you say absolutely nothing. I'm the complete opposite. If I hear the teacher yelling at another kid and he's an African-American, I immediately come in. What's the problem? Oh, he did this. He did this. He did this. I pull the kid out of the classroom and I talk to the kid personally, one-on-one, -on -one, not embarrass the kid in front of everybody in, in the classroom. Pull the kid out one-on-one -on -one, and nine times out of ten, it's a lack of communication. The teacher thought that he was doing one thing while the kid was doing something totally different. And the teacher's word is law. So when the teacher sends the kid to the principal's office, the principal doesn't care what the kid has to say. The teacher is always right. And to be honest with you, the teacher is not always right. Yes, brother, you had your hand up. There you go. Absolutely. Allahu Akbar.
to bless me and show him that I care about him. And guess what? I have even some of them, I give them names, which are my superstar. Okay? When, I, when you say that word, her, her also demeanor, being. Yes. Uh, and listen, you, the thing about that is somebody who has made an effort yes. to know. And that's another issue that you're not this just there for the paycheck. You have a lot of teachers, even in the public school, that are there for a paycheck. They don't care about the child's behavior. The child's behavior should be disciplined. At the end of the day, they collect their paycheck. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Good point. So we're talking about understanding the culture. And to his point, he said a lot of teachers that are in the Islamic schools now that are teaching, many of them don't have degrees. And many of them in their own respective countries probably would not have been welcomed or would not be teachers in their own respective countries. But then come to here to America um, because they you know, have this... I don't know if you want to call it nepotism, but, you know, they have this in with, you know, this school or that school and they're given a pass to teach. But a teacher is not just a teacher in the classroom. You are that child's parent. You are that child's protector. You are that child's defender. You are everything for that child. And you're not just there to teach the child. You are there to be compassionate with the child. You're there to be merciful to the child. You're there to show love to the child. And if that is not what you have to offer, then don't step into that arena. Because children require all of that. You are there to de-escalate conflicts between the children. Don't turn a blind eye and say, well, that's not, I don't get paid for that. Then you are in the wrong business. And it's not to say that all Arabs or all Indo-Pak, um, um, you know, uh, teachers are like this. But many of them are like that. Many of them are like that. Because they don't understand the culture. So I, I think it's important that African Americans... Uh, pull their resources together and they open up their own school. It has to happen. At some point, it has to happen. And I'm not saying that it hasn't happened. There are, you know, Madrasa to Ahlul Sunnah, um, you know, in East Orange, New Jersey, you know, uh, African American owned, operated, you know what I mean? African Americans. Um, and I mean, uh, there are others. Uh, you know, if, if I'm missing out on anything else, I'm, I'm sure there are others, but there are more. Our children need options because we don't have any options. So when we pull our children out of the Islamic school, the only other option they have is public school or home school. Th those are our options. Islamic school, public school, or home school. Those are our own options. And, and, no, and we should have more options. With all of the resources that we have in our communities, why aren't there more options for that? You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. But, no. So when I when I'm talking about institutional learning, I'm talking about institutions like school, high school, you know, um, you know, um, grammar school, high school, necessary, as well as other institutions, learning institutions, Arabic institutions, you know, Islamic studies institutions. We have more than enough students of knowledge who have graduated, who have degrees, who are proficient in many of the different fields of knowledge in Islam that have the ability to establish institutions. We just need brothers that have money behind them to get behind these students of knowledge and help them to open these institutions. And these can be tax write-offs. There's so many incentives that people with money should jump at the opportunity to get behind these brothers. Students of knowledge should not have to come home and drive Uber. And, and this is what is happening, becoming truck drivers, driving Uber. Here's a man who spent, you know, the past seven, eight, nine, ten years of his life studying Islam only to graduate with a bachelor's degree, master's degree, right, and come home and he's driving Uber. I mean, we should be ashamed of ourselves as a community. Because if he came home to drive Uber, Allah knows best what his life was like in the Islamic university or any other university. If you think that college students here in America are poor, you have yet to see the poverty that students in the Islamic University and other universities experience. Poor beyond what you could imagine. If you thought that in university you were broke and you were poor and you didn't have anything, 
Think about students in the Islamic University who are surviving off of a $270 stipend monthly. Could you survive off of $270 a month? That's a lot of money? Not for a student in Syria. But in America, we grow up a different way. We don't grow up the way they grow up in Syria. We have a different standard of living. Uh huh. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Someone said that's less than a welfare check. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, looking at, you know, where the person is at, and, you know, some people come there and survive. You have people from West Africa, Muslims from West Africa come there, and $270 a month stipend for them is like they're in heaven. But they grew up differently, they had a different, you know, a style of living. Whereas when we come from America, we have a different standard of living. And we make the sacrifices. I mean, when you make that sacrifice, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensates you. You know, with iman, compensates you with ilm, with real knowledge, with faith. And all of the other things that come along with the sacrifices that you have made for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's, it's not necessarily a loss. But as, as a community who knows that there's students over there, that this is their struggle. And we don't reach out to send them $100 here. You know, that goes a long way, man. That goes a long way, $100, man, a month on top of the stipend that they are receiving. That goes a long way for a college student overseas. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It's just about time for Salat wa Isha. You guys have been great. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Wa akhiru da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen. person asking a question, he said, if you have a spouse who hates on you, Versus fanning your flame, do you change your threshold? Well, it's not that simple. This person doesn't help me, you know, in my ambition. So should I just ask the person for a divorce and divorce? It's not that simple. A marriage is an investment. And that's another part of marriage that we've lost sight of. When people got married, you know, years ago, marriages were investments. They were making allies. They were political decisions. They were, you know, merging, you know, finances, this, you know, political reasons, financial reasons. And today we just marry purely for love. And once love is gone, the relationship is gone. Marriage is, you know, is the merge, the, the merging of two families. This political statement, financial stability, you have homosexuals who are fighting to get married so they have someone to leave their wealth to. You understand? These are that marriage is not just an institution of love. And and you know when we see it as that once the love once we believe the love is gone, then the marriage is over. Marriage is deeper than just an institution of love. But marriage is, you know, politics, the merging of families, the, you know, financial stability, all of those things. And you don't make a decision to toss a marriage out the window simply because you are married to someone that doesn't necessarily support your endeavors. And one of the things brothers and sisters have to learn how to do in their marriages is seek self-validation rather than waiting on your spouse to validate you. You're saying to your spouse, well, when do you see me? When do you validate me? Validate yourself. Why are you sitting around, you know, and superimposing on your spouse to give you something that maybe they possibly can't give you? Someone who doesn't have something can't give you what they don't have. So while you're sitting around waiting for the day for me to validate you, that never happens. So then you're always incomplete. Learn how to validate yourself. Even if your spouse doesn't support your endeavors, then you have to find friends of your marriage or other friends outside of your marriage that will support your endeavors. Just because a person is married to you doesn't mean that they don't have their insecurities. You have spouses that are jealous of one another. This spouse hates the fact that her spouse, you know, especially if it's a man who started off at a very low level when they got married. She was the one with the degree. She was the one making all the money. And then the man somehow pulls himself up by his boot strings, bootstraps, and he gets into university, he graduates with his bachelor's degree. Then he goes into his master's degree. He now surpassed his wife. And now he's gotten into a good job and steady income and a career where she was now the one financially, you know, handling everything. Now everything shifts to him. You don't think that that would create some level of jealousy in some marriages? It does. Don't think that because you're married to someone that that can't create jealousy between spouses. Absolutely. 
And so you're turning around, looking at your spouse, trying to figure out why is this person not supporting me in my endeavors? Because the person is jealous of the fact that at one point the power dynamics were in their hands and now it has shifted to your hands. It happens. It happens between broad blood brothers and sisters. Prophet Yusuf السلام, was a victim of jealousy, his own brothers. What did Yaqub say to him? لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدون لك كيدا Don't tell your vision to your brothers or they're going to plot against you. This was his own blood brothers. So how much more could that be a possibility between husband and wife? Don't, don't think because you're married to someone and you're happily married to someone that there can't exist jealousy within marriages. It exists. But you have to learn how to seek validation through other means instead of waiting for your spouse to validate you or to see you or to, you know, you know, uh, meet you where you are in terms of where you feel you need to be met in terms of being validated. You know, you have to find another way to get that. But I don't think that you should throw your marriage out the door simply because you're married to someone that doesn't necessarily support you in your endeavors. What if they're good in other areas of the marriage? You understand? Maybe they don't support you in, in your business or what you're doing, but maybe they're a good spouse. Maybe they're a good father to your children. Maybe they're a good mother to the kids. Right? And they have some insecurities about your endeavors. So be it. But I don't I personally don't think that that's a reason to throw the entire marriage out. And I'm only answering the question based on how it was asked. If there are some more details to that situation, then inshallah you can ask on a more private note. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وعقم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته